Yeah, I see that. Well, hi, Dylan Stevens. Thanks for coming and chatting to me today. We're going to uh, discuss the Gurdjieff work. Um, and Dylan, I wondered if you could just start with why Gurdjieff for you? What is it that appeals to you? Oh, uh, well, uh, first of all, I'm glad to be talking to you. It sounds like a fun thing to be able to do, share our, our information. I, I feel that sharing between all of us is very important. Um, well, Gurdjieff was really something that I, uh, I discovered from his book, Beelzebub's Tales, because to me, I just read that book. And I said to myself, this person really knows something that I always believed in and nobody else talks about. It just resonated to me amazingly. And amazingly, the same thing happened to my wife, that she read it and felt the same thing. And I, uh, I, I find it really strange that so many people have had trouble with the book and have, um, have misunderstood a lot of the things in the book. But yet, um, you know, whether, whether what, he's, what Kajev said in his uh, writings was true or not, it was really basically the tone of the book that resonated, that it was a world different than the world that we live in every, from day to day. And it, it really fulfilled my longing. Um, and at that point, I, I tried to figure out where there was a group. And of course, that was hidden, right? You had to know somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. And eventually, I found the um, Mr. Nyland's group up in Warwick, New York. And I started going up there on the weekends. And the format of that was uh, you'd work on the farm there. They'd hand you a shovel or a spade. Or One of the things I did was run a wheelbarrow because they were digging they were digging a basement. They were digging the basement area of the barn that he had bought, where he did his talks, and they were building a lower level. So they were digging it out, and I would bring my wheelbarrow up, have it filled with dirt, and then run it up to the place where they were building a bridge, where they were going to build a school. And um, so that's what I did on the weekends. And they would break at the end of the day, and then Mr. Nyland would give a talk, and his talks were really inspiring. Very, very much, um, I guess, Christian kind of uh, uh, flavor to to his talks, and um, I was always like a Christian too. With um, I was brought up as a Christian scientist, so believing in Jesus, but not taking things literally, <laughs> basically, you know, so that it all made sense to me, and I I enjoyed that a lot. And I got to being an out coming up on the weekends. I had a chance to visit him on two separate occasions, so that was interesting. I, uh, I, although it was it was sad in a way because again, the Beelzebub's tales brought me to the work, and then when I chatted with him and asked him specific questions about Beelzebub's tales, and he. Um, he couldn't, he didn't answer them. And all he did was say, well, did you read the first page where you had to read it once and then you had to read it out loud to somebody and then you had to read it for comprehension? He said, well, um, have you done it that way? I said, no, I've read it five times, but I haven't read it that way. And he said, well, you need to do that. And so then it was like, okay, well, I did the first part. <laughs> so then I, during the breaks between the work at the farm, I would start reading it out loud to nobody, you know, but just reading it out loud, thinking there was some sort of magic spell to doing that. And I just felt that didn't seem right to me because I felt like I understood the book already. And um, the next time I saw him, I bought a candle at the shop that's part of the, uh, of the group. And it was a really pretty candle. I gave it to him. And I, I guess the thing was, the first time I saw him, he was sort of angry that I was asking a stupid question about Beelzebub's tales when I hadn't followed the right method. And, and so, but this time when I gave him the candle, he was suddenly so loving and nice. 
And it's like, I'm thinking, well, is this because I brought the candle from his group and gave it to him? Because his comment was, oh, you know, I haven't been over to that shop in a long time. They really make great candles. And I, I just, um, that really, that turned me off. I felt like, is that why he's being nice to me? Because I brought him a candle. Um, and I, I just, um, I kind of gave up on that group at that point and kind of went off on my own. And, uh, yeah, because I, I also realized that so many people in the group had not read Beelzebub's Tales. So to me, it all came down to Beelzebub's Tales. All right, all right there's another crazy thing I did. They, they had a group, I guess it was a joint meeting of all the different good chief groups that I had been invited to because I was part of Ni Mr. Nyland's group. And um, they asked, they did a question and answer se session. And I, and I, the question I asked was that there's one sort of obscure passage where um, Kajif says that you need to rest from your, from your mentation, from your active mentation. You need a period of rest or something. He mentioned one statement like that. So I asked that question. <laughs> and of the people on the stage, they gave it to uh, Mr. Nyland's wife, who's very young. And I know why they gave it to her, because they felt it was the stupidest question they had ever heard asked. And so be, she basically treated me like I didn't know what I was talking about. I needed to go back and read the book more carefully, because it, that, was a, that wasn't an important question. <laughs> and again, it was like, whoa, <laughs> I don't get it, you know, because it was a serious question, because it, it was strange to me, because I felt that why would there be times that you wouldn't actually be following the work. Why would you have, why would you need times of rest for the work? It was a serious question. It, it seems trivial to me now, um, but it's all, it's all part of this problem with those groups. I don't know if you've had that with your groups because the whole all and everything is such a different format. It's so you're allowed to talk about trivial things in your, and, and be real people. Whereas these other groups, people sit and they're afraid to ask a question because they'll be ridiculed. And it's, a lot of times it's almost just total silence because people are afraid to ask a question. And when they do ask questions, it's always the questions, the silly questions about what does it mean to be impartial? Um, how does one, how does one conscious it's always those questions and they're always asked and you can't really answer that question. <laughs> I mean, you can ask that question and say, okay, read Beelzebub's tales is what I would ask. I would say to that question. Um, it's all experience, isn't it? It's how yeah. you experience it from what you've read. Then you go out and you do what you've been reading about or trying to not, you don't do, you observe how you are. Yeah. And just yeah. like back to what you were saying, I thought there was no stupid questions. I, I, I don't like it when people treat people as if they're stupid, because they <laughs> learn otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, everyone has their own level of understanding, and then also it's the whole language problem. When you don't really know what the person said, because language is not very, very detailed, right? It's um, so... Um, well, Gurdjieff says that as well, doesn't he? You might say one thing to me, and I I see it in a different way as to how you've said it, and then a third person comes along and joins in, and they see it completely different to how either of us are saying. Yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. So, um, let's see, I don't know, do you want to ask a question, or shall I just go on with my monologue? I don't know what well, we should... Let me ask you about with the towels, because you say you, you didn't um, read it out loud or you didn't benefit much from reading it out loud. I, I right. myself did when I did, but it's different for everyone. As Gurdjieff says that the towels, even though he's given them instructions, maybe it only works in a certain way when you're ready to read it out loud or when you're ready to read it to somebody else. So, uh, what do you think on that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I actually, I met this person who had done the readings for um, 
There are different versions of people reading it out loud. Um, I forget what the site is, but he had, what's his name? I can't remember what his name was, but it was, he uses a pseudonym, pseudonym for reading it. Harold. And what? Harold Good. Um, oh, yeah, that's his site. I think that's his site. Yeah, that he has the tales up there and he has um, a person reading the tales. So that was the person. He was at the conference that and he had done that reading. And he said he was said that too, how much he he felt it was important to read it out loud. And I still don't see that at all because I'm in a I, when I read. Well, I guess it's part it might be the part of problem of being dyslexic because I have to take those words and reverse them in my brain in order to speak them you know it, it's a it's and it's hard to explain that I, I was a I was a slow reader at the beginning in school because of that I had to so it's this effort of of reversing the words where I'm not I don't really know exactly what I've just read as well as I would looking at the picture of the words because I can read quite fast now just seeing paragraph by paragraph and also reading is too slow for me I, I can't stand to hear somebody read it to me because I want to just see I want to see a paragraph right there and 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 you, you actually have to do that with the Elzebub's tales because the paragraphs are so long if you're not looking at the beginning and the end of the paragraph by the time you get to the end of the paragraph you've probably forgotten what it's talking about i think <laughs> so that's why you have to put so much effort into reading <laughs> isn't it well but then maybe your dyslexia is helping you to put that effort into reading it so maybe i don't have dyslexia myself maybe i don't have that immediate effort to put in yeah well you know you could say that that's why i needed to do it because it, you know <laughs> but i i think that I think the content is more important than the reading. That's my position, I think. Uh, and, I, and I think I have, I would say I have perhaps the best understanding of the Elspub's tales of anyone that I've ever met. So that's what, <laughs> as, as you saw of what I presented in the conference, the fact that I, that I definitely have the position that the stopender is missing in uh, Holy Planet Purgatory. The law stop and there is missing out of what Kajif wrote. And um, I've read, read everyone, if you read, if you read Bennett's um, uh, talks on Beelzebub's tales, it's a, that, that particular thing he did. If you read through that, he just goes right along by saying that the order of the vibrations, um, it goes from um, Sidori Mifa, soul, soul to, it jumps from soul to exio Harry, and then it goes to resulsaren, resulsaren. And, and he just, and Bennett just accepts that that's true. But, but I think that, um, well, I, I totally believe that it's missing and it was a mistake because if you, especially if you compare it to Uspensky's, the presentation that he gave to Uspensky, it's clear that, that there was a law presented there because if you look at the way it was drawn out with the three levels, the lower level and the middle level and the upper level, so the head and the heart and the body, that law was in the middle there in that, and it was graphed out as existing. And, but at that time, when he presented it to Spensky, he didn't tell you which, what these, how these related to the different organs of the body, the way he did with Beelzebub's tales. So the only thing he did say was Exio Harry was, the heart was T, or C was Exio Harry. And I think everybody agrees that that's a true statement. I don't have to argue about that one. Although the trouble is to, when you find the missing law, then you come up with all these possible ways that you could run that, that uh, through. Um, and I don't know, did you actually vote in my, in my competition or yes. not? <laughs> I just, I just want, so listeners know, 
we were at the All and Everything conference and you had, um, you gave a paper, but you also did a little competition. Right. Do you want to explain your competition? What your competition was so people can keep up to speed? Well, to to see what the people thought, if there was a missing one, first of all, is, is there one miss, is there a missing stop in there? And if, and if not, um, what is your version of the way it works, right? It's, you know, they, they had the reading upstairs and they had the reading downstairs at one point. It was, it was the same day that I gave the talk. And those who are upstairs, I asked for every, I asked to do the, those, those um, vibrations in Holy Planet Purgatory. I said, could we do that? And, and we actually did that as a group. And as we were going through it, everybody was amazed to see that it was missing. Because when you look at it in detail, you see that it's missing. And that's what that present, the one who introduced me said, we had a, we had an amazing discussion upstairs, which was quite illuminating. But, but you know, it was very sad because very few people entered my competition. I mean, it wasn't to do as a gimmick. I was hoping that I would get input from people because I struggled with that for years and years. How can you make it all work out? Because if, if you see that, if you see that um, Exio Harry is T or C, then you end up with one missing. It's it's very simple, but but what other people do is they they it counts up to seven because he suddenly threw in this results around thing which would make up the seven. So he had one two three four five and he actually starts he starts off that section by by listing them as seven. So you've got seven there, but what is but there to me there's no doubt that the seventh is exio hurry and not results are in, but some people claim that's results are because that would be well whatever story they can make up about that those who did argue with me had that position or else people will say well those those that other people came up with the concept because there's this um when he goes from um, remove, when he goes from soul to exio Harry, he talks about and what you need to know is there's a special pathway called something like Trin Trinva. Yeah. And so so then other people said, okay, well that's the one that's missing. That's the pathway. And uh, so that would be other other people took that view, and they're the ones that that agreed with me that 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 it was missing. Because I was just thinking for for those, because it is a difficult law, isn't it, to follow the law of octaves? And we're talking about the seven, and to many he uses the mute. Uh, uses the musical notes, doesn't he? Do re mi fa right. sol right. la si. Is that right? Do re mi fa sol la si. Then back to do again. Yes, right. So yeah. He, you're talking about this other stopping, this uh, missing stopping that is between. Yeah, soul actually, this was this is by I saved this handout here that I had done at the conference. Let me just put it up on the screen here. Mm -hmm. That would help. See, there it is. That's fine. We can see that. So we have the food octave, and we've got the obviously the enneagram for those that uh, don't know what it's called. So we have the triangle of the three, six, nine. And then on top of that is the one to the four to the two to the eight to the five to the seven. And that would be the do re do starts at one. Well, it moves, doesn't it? So it doesn't have to start at one. Well, it, it's been numbered as one because that's the way you do the repeating de decimal. Yeah. So then the nine is almost the completion. Um, so that works out well to connect the uh, you make the anagram by connecting the repeating decimal things make the Enneagram, but the Enneagram really doesn't have an importance to the way, to the missing stop and there. <laughs> but you see that what I've done here is that on this side, okay, this side um, is uh, I've made up this, this um, for law, I've called it harmoniary because I filled it in with an organ 
that Gajif Isay has has left out right there. But other people, you know, they just come up from here and then jump up to number eight. It's backwards. <laughs> Is it right ways up that you're seeing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're seeing it the right okay, way. So Exio, Exio Harry's here, and then the missing one is here. And down here are the, are the two parts of the brain, which I had a, a problem with also. But um, this is the one that I say is missing. And it, it, it's, it, to me, it's clear and in search of the miraculous because uh, actually even if Spensky was calling this, uh, this section, he was calling it uh, the um, endocrine system. He actually does that. He kind of divides the whole circle up into different the the stomach the digestive system and he also has the uh, the, um, the endocrine system in that in that section so I haven't really gone that far afield but I also if you figure out which system is missing out of here it would be the endocrine system because you can the other systems are kind of there the of the parts of the body that are important leaving out things like skin that aren't important. But um, that's, that's um, to me, that's the thing. How, you know, why haven't pe people been bothered by that? Because I finally, after searching a long time, I, uh, um, I found this person who had written the book, and he, uh, and he was the one that said it was missing. And then he went, on to prove that uh, how it how it could be resolved and it was a very complicated thing which most people can't understand you kind of feel it with like a train pulling the pulling the stops across I I have it diagrammed out in in my website but anyway that he was the first person that said it's missing and I said wow finally somebody <laughs> agrees with me that it's missing because nobody else agreed and so then at that point, I just went out on a limb and, and wrote it up on my site and said it's missing. And then when this conference came along and, and a friend of mine who I'd been talking to, he said, well, if you submitted a paper, you should submit a paper. And, and I said, oh, well, obviously it would be that one, right? <laughs> and then it was sad that I didn't have enough time to talk about it because that's a really heavy subject. I think, I know that the, the you went off and did a video instead of attending one of the lectures. <laughs> and I think I know what lecture that is. But you it wasn't a lecture, go. actually. It was one of the seminars. I never miss a lecture. But if people the, want to read your paper that you gave at that conference, it's in that proceedings, isn't it? I think it's yes, it is. Right. Yeah. All and Everything um, conference proceedings for 2019. Or would it be 2018? 2018. 2018, yeah. of course it would be, yes. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's in there. And, and on Amazon, you can see my name as one of the people that's yeah. in it. But, but my 10-minute my <laughs> thing was so long that they asked if they could cut it down because I had, the, what I did submit was much longer even than what's printed. But that's okay because I had just done all of the I was comparing each each vibration to each of the Spensky diagrams, you know, just to go down carefully, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, and back to do, following the Spensky diagrams. And um, so it was all there in, in greater detail. So it was basically all printed up, right? So, but see, it was, that was such a heavy subject that they should have let me do a talk on it. And I would have, um, and I think that um, I, I'm still reeling, actually, from the presentation about um, Beelzebub's America <laughs> with that spreadsheet that that person came up with, where he, I, I still have it and I haven't looked at it again, but it was sort of like uh, ham sandwiches are mentioned in this paragraph, three times in this paragraph. <laughs> and <laughs> And he went on. He went on to to um, he went on he went on too long. And then his his conclusion wasn't long enough because I wanted to know really know what exactly was he trying to prove. 
So, I mean, it's my fault that I haven't gone back to look at it, but I feel as if it's a shame that my paper wasn't one of them there because I could have answered a lot of people's questions. You can always submit um, another paper to the conference for another year. <laughs> <laughs> You're always welcome to. But then that's one of the great things about this conference. People can come at it from all different angles. Yeah. Is, yeah, I, and uh, and I, I give them credit for that because I, I'm sure that I my paper wouldn't have been accepted by by the um, Gajif uh, organization, the real Gajif organization, which, um, yeah, P Pentland. That was that was the interesting thing. It took when I read I read a book and I was I couldn't believe the fact that Nyland. Mr. Nyland's group wasn't part of the Guji Foundation, that he would he had been a breakaway person. And I was horrified to think, well, maybe that's why I kind of broke up with him because I wasn't part of it. So I wrote I wrote a letter to the foundation and and uh, Lloyd Pentland. Um, uh, what did he do? Oh, he uh, he con contacted um, this other lady. I'm not can't remember her name now but she called me up and said that she had been told for her to speak to me and then I went up to this Vancouver group and and met with her and her husband and uh, and talked about my problem with with uh, Mr. Nyland they were they were they were really glad to hear from me because they could never understand why Mr. Nyland left the foundation so, um, but I, that was the foundation group that was in Vancouver. So I've kind of been a rebel though, because I, I just, I don't see, <laughs> I don't see any of them having the actual truth. I think Gurdjieff would be proud that you're a bit of a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I wish I was around because I would, I, I would have had the gumption to tell him you made a mistake because, you know, when you think about him and his stature, nobody would tell him he made a mistake. I, you know, they you would just be so afraid to do that. You would think that you were probably wrong and, and he was right and you wouldn't even dare to tell him that he was wrong. But I, I know that I would have told him that he was wrong and I think it would have been a good thing because I still believe that he made a mistake when he finally got around to what he presented to Spensky in this in search, in search of the miraculous he forgot what he had taught and got confused because he put this result I mean results are in is obviously the higher dough of that whole octave just by the way he talks about it and and he got confused because he had seven seven things there but that was really the eighth that would that should have been number eight in that list because that's the higher dough. You count those. When you say he got confused, you mean Ospensky or Gurdjieff? Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff, when he was telling it to Ospensky. Yes. I mean, maybe Ospensky. No, no, no. He, he was confused when he did all and, all and Everything. When he got to that chapter and talked about it, he got confused and left out law and the organ that corresponds to law. I, I, there's no other way that it can be read, so it's like, <laughs> but you, see, does, didn't that bother you? Hasn't it bothered you? Or you just accept it? That's... Well, I didn't realize it until I saw you at the conference, and it's something I've looked at, but I've never really understood that chapter, so maybe that's why it's not come up to me. But my yeah, well, that, is... That's, okay, I've been interrupting you, but that, that is true. People get to that chapter, and they just blown away. There's too much in that chapter. It's... Mm -hmm. It covers so many different things, and it's so confusing. It's a very technical chapter, and people just say, oh, well, I don't really like that chapter. I don't understand it, right? They don't take the time to go through it in detail. So that's what you're saying, right? That you never, it never bothered you. Because it bothered me almost immediately that I read it. I think at first, I, because I didn't understand it, I didn't realize that maybe there was something wrong. Yeah. When you brought it up at the conference, I used to wonder, I wonder if he did it wrong on purpose to make us question, and maybe you're one of the few people. That <laughs> That's the cop-out, isn't it? 
I tend to think that he'd got it wrong. So I, I don't know what to think about it now, but I do try and read Purgatory again. And I still get a little bit confused. Like I do get muddled on that part of the book uh, very much, which is why going to the All and Everything conference helps me because we discuss it there a lot. Talking to people like yourself about it, it yeah. helps me. Yeah, because I, I mean, that's what I had wished for if, we, if it could have been a full-blown discussion to me, for me to present it in a, mm. not mm. in 10 minutes, but for like at least a half hour and then what? had had people ask questions of me. I, I, I wish I had had that opportunity. Well, I wonder if what we should have done was maybe opened an evening up. But sometimes after the talks, we'd all meet somewhere, wouldn't we? Perhaps in a coffee bar or a bar, and we should have said, right, Dylan's going to continue his <laughs> Let's go and question him and see what, what we can get out of him or what we can offer. Maybe we needed to do something like that. Oh, but see, off the panel, though, um, there were, there was one person that was really antagonistic towards me and felt that it shouldn't, the paper shouldn't even be present. Well, it, it shouldn't even be presented. And um, I don't remember who that was, but so there was, it was, um, what are the names of the people now? I'm really well, bad maybe, with them. Maybe it's because you pushed buttons of people having to rethink purgatory. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> See it away. I'm, sure I'm sure that's what it is, yeah. And some people so, don't like to be told that Gurdjieff might have made a mistake. That would probably have hurt a lot of people. How could he have, kind of thing. But it right, should be open right. discussion and people should be able to, you know, argue it in a, a nice, friendly, you know, right. way. Right. Yeah, because well, so in the in the argument, you, you get to rethink it yourself. They say, oh, well, let me go back and reread this. Because I... I I certainly believed he didn't make a mistake, and I kept trying to run it different ways. You know, if you, and that's part of the problem is that I had to go through in my paper the definition of the stop and there itself. He's not consistent with that. Is it the note or is it the space between the, the notes? He has, he talks about two different definitions because you can, you can make it work if you work with the space between the notes instead of the note itself, then you can make it work out as I not saying. <laughs> so I've often done that. And it's like, no, it's, it's, I, I guess the thing is that I, I, all and everything, what I started with Uspensky in search, search of the Miraculous. So I knew that book really, really well before I read All and Everything. So I, I already had a picture in my head about what the different vibrations were. That chapter was the killer chapter in Uspensky with how you created the Enneagram with the repeating decimal. And the amazing thing about how you have the, um, the triangle within the circle. So you had the law of three and the law of seven. That just resonated with me perfectly. But of course, that's the difference though is that the Uspensky one is quite cold. It's not warm. I mean, it's crazy that I'd use the word like warm for all and everything because he's basically attacking everything. But I, there was, a, it was, it's the warmth of, that you can feel how wonderful he would have been to me. Uh, Kajif would have been a wonderful person to me. You know? um, so I, I miss that. Um, I was born in uh, 1947, so I could have seen him <laughs> as a baby, right? Baby, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you right, have a strong pull with the towels. You you feel that it, um, like the Enneagram, he, Gurdjieff says that if you understood the Enneagram, you, you would understand all and everything. Yeah, that's true, right. And and actually, that book of that person who was try who said it was a missing one, he tried to show that um, that Beelzebub's tale was written with the enneagram in mind, and actually, and so was meetings with remarkable men that you can diagram them around the any yeah that but that's the thing that uh, Kajif never mentioned the enneagram in all and er in all and everything in anything. In any of the well, except the third one, which I 
consider not really his work. Um, but in meetings with Malcolm Van and, and uh, Beelzebub's Tales, he doesn't mention the word Enneagram at all. That comes from the teachings to Uspensky, which is quite intriguing, right? <laughs> that, the, that the Enneagram was really hidden inside um, Beelzebub's Tales. And Uspensky only sort of just mentions it, doesn't he? That, you know, he was told, he saw this symbol and he asked, and Gurdjieff was trying to explain to him if he knew it. If you understood it, you'd know everything, and that's it. You don't get any more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'd say Spensky was was um, was mesmerized by that symbol because he's very mathematical, and so I'd say he's the one that made that symbol popular, and yet that's become the symbol of Gurdjieff, which is interesting, isn't it? <laughs> and that was all because of Spensky. So it, it's interesting. So do you? But um, Gurdjieff, you were saying about Gurdjieff and the Enneagram is in the Beelzebub's Tales. Is it perhaps the chapters or the, you know, uh, maybe you could explain on that a bit more. Well, I just, um, yeah, the, the connection of the different chapters. He's got, um, he does six visits to Earth, I think. He's the, and the sixth one is if you connect those numbers, they will relate to each other in in the tales, the different numbers. And the reason there wouldn't, the reason there wasn't a seventh is because, as you see, that we've numbered it around and we've ended one, two, three, four, five, six, around the enneagram. Mm -hmm. There is no. Is there no seven? Is that a correct statement? Let me see. No, this one, two, three, four, five. Okay, if you don't count the triangle, one, two, three, four, five, six. See, if you don't count the triangle, it's there are six, six yeah. points. Six. So each one of those, each one of those, is is a chapter, and they and they have then they relate to each other in in all and everything in in Beelzebub's tales, and the same thing would be true in meetings with remarkable men that that the different characters connect via the Enneagram. They have a relationship to each other. Oh, I've not I, I, that one before. That's new on me. Okay. I map these out on my uh, on my site. I, I, I'm really big on diagrams because I can build them pretty nicely. So I, I, I map those those three those two things out. But but again, I think um, that's that's the interesting thing, though, that I don't think that the Enneagram has any real importance. Um, the way that people use it, you know, that well, I've seen people say, OK, that means that on Monday such and such and on Thursday such and such is related because you ate fish on Friday that it relates to, uh, I don't know, to so what is that you, you serve Monday or something like that yeah. because you're following the Enneagram lines. I've, I've seen so many people do that. And I, 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 that seems to me like utter garbage. They're trying uh, to use it as a divining device, aren't they? Which I don't think it is. And I don't think it's a type. So you get a lot of this uh, different types. You, you could be type number one or type number two of the people personality. Oh, yeah, that whole know. personality oh. thing is just horrible. But, that that if you look on the on the internet now about the enneagram, those personality types are, are higher in in search value than than just Gurdjieff's enneagram, mm. which is terrible, isn't it? I I mean, it, so you've got so in, so you've got nine different types of people because the enneagram is around nine. So. OK, but you could have done 15 different types of people or you could have done, you know, or astrology, 12 different types of people. Right. I mean, it's you can make a story about anything. And I, I just they they've just stolen the Enneagram for that purpose. But Gurdjieff said that I'm sure he said some of this, that there's 28 types of people. So, you know, it's a shame. Oh, no, right. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> That's a good point. Exactly. <laughs> So he even contradicts those people that have made a living out of 
<laughs> Enneagram types. <laughs> yes, exactly. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, it's very interesting. I, I look at it quite a lot, actually. Um, uh, just, just wizard. What's it called? Just wizard dot com. Have I got that right? Your website, um, just wizard dot com, on the on Gurdjieff work. Yeah. Let me just check that. I'll look here to. Yes, could you have just wizard.com? Yes. Because um, you have some fascinating articles up there about them. And, uh, and you mentioned earlier about uh, the third book, Life is Real. And um, you, many people don't think that was written by him. Maybe you could explain a little bit more why you don't think it was. <laughs> okay, well, I could, I could tell you my total frustration about that book because Wisner's bookstore is in New York. And they were the ones that printed the books in America anyway. And they were ama an amazing bookstore. You could find anything about spirituality in that store, just globs and globs of books. And um, I used to go to there a lot. And um, I heard that there was a, what that uh, Life is Real, Life is Real was, had been released. I had heard it from from my group in Warwick. And so I went to the, the store and I said that I wanted to get that book. And they said, oh, you can only have that if you're on the list. <laughs> and I said, oh, <laughs> wow. I'm on the list. And yes, I was. <laughs> so <laughs> I really felt special, you know, that I didn't know that my, my list, I mean, I imagine anyone that from any good chief group was on that list who could have the book because that that even though nylon was was a a different group than the foundation obviously the foundation people were on that list but they had also put on nylon's people and i paid my i paid my the dues were like five dollars a month right and i paid it faithfully i was struggling trying to pay the rent but i always paid my five dollars a month and it drives me nuts when people want to do these seminars and retreats and they're charging hundreds and hundreds of dollars for it. I don't feel that spiritual things should cost much. And that to me was wonderful. It was like a way of, this is my contribution. I'm, I'm going to do that every month. I'm going to pay my five dollars every month. And um, one, one time I, I met the lady who was the secretary and she said, oh, you're the one that's been giving this money. <laughs> and uh, <You're> the only one. <laughs> <laughs> so getting back to that, so I said, okay, well, I'm special. I'm going to buy two books. I'll buy two books today, right now, right now. And I bring them home, and I'm so excited, and I start reading them, and I said, this isn't right. Think about what he said. This book was going to be. This was going to be, and and the key was that he talked about. There were going to be three chapters in it um, from meetings with remarkable men. He met three people there and in each of those special people, he said he was not going to talk about it in meetings with remarkable men. He was going to save it for his third book where he would discuss it, the meaning of the soul and the meaning of the astral body and the meaning of how to take care of the physical body, the three, the three ways really. Um, that's what he said he would talk about. Well, that's not in there for starters. It's not there. And that blew me away. And then you start reading it and it reads like all of the different intros and the prefaces of Beelzebub's Tales and um, Meetings with the Remarkable Men, those ramblings that he did. And then you could see that there was a, and they threw in a lecture and then it ends at the middle of a sentence. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You're going to, you have the nerve to call that by the name of the book that Kachif was going to write and then didn't write. And I, I feel that, I feel that he didn't write it because the reception to Beelzebub's Tales was so vicious, really. So many people said, you're writing sentences that nobody else can read. You're going to have to rewrite this whole thing if you expect people to understand it. People just can't understand it. And 
And I think that he was just totally frustrated with the fact that this was, this is the book that tells everything that he knew about. And if people can't understand that, it, it's, um, so he didn't complete the book because he felt that people weren't, you could say people weren't ready for it. Um, but he certainly should have given us the lectures that he heard <laughs> in person, right? The memories of those lectures that he left out, at least he should have given us that. I also object to the fact that the last chapter be on uh, meetings with remarkable men to end on the material question. I mean, it was, it's, it was a fun story to see how he painted the canaries, which was part of my contest. To, to give a painted canary to those who won. I mean, it was interesting, but for that to be the last book of Meetings with Remarkable Man is just a travesty also. He didn't intend that to be. He didn't intend it to be because you can see that it's not one of the Enneagram points and it doesn't have a chapter number. It was added by the students or whatever because they thought, hey, this is really cute too. I mean, what is that telling you that it's it's worth swindling people just because you have something important to give to other people? You're going to swindle a bunch of pe poor people, and so that you can teach spiritual things, so-called spiritual things, to other people. I think it just sets the wrong precedent. That's the precedent that I see with people who do these seminars. This concept of retreat, <laughs> every different religious organization has this concept of a retreat where they buy some place that's really cute and nice and calm and peaceful. And then they charge hundreds of dollars for people to go to it. And, and people seem to be satisfied with that because they can just live their regular lives, their whole lives. And, and, but then one month or a week out of the year, they can go to retreat and be spiritual and feel that they're still, still, still spiritual. And of course, they paid a lot of money for it, so it must be worth it, right? It's like, so I, I, I really can't stand that chapter in Meetings with Remarkable Men. But the whole of the third book, there's very little there that I see of a value. It's just, I have to go back to Beelzebub's Tales as being the absolute gospel. I think that people should spend more time with the the Holy Planet Purgatory chapter, it's all there. <laughs> and then the form and sequence is also a perfect explanation of the, of how you do the work. Um, <clears throat> the concept of, the concept of, um, you know, and that's what the, the groups go, th the struggle with is how do you observe yourself in life? How do you um, and that's so important to building a higher body. Um, but that's um, no, it's such a, a huge subject. It's hard to put in context. The law that's missing out of the out of the uh, out of the food octave being uh, the endocrine system. That's what I was saying in my talk. Is that that is that tells you what the what the feeling is that's necessary. The agape love of Christianity is love that doesn't need a return. It's love given out. It's it's impartiality in a way. That's the other word that's used in in the work. Um, and then you see that it's tied to the endocrine system. It's tied to the emotional center, more of like not the crazy emotions but the soft, quiet emotions that come from the heart. If you put your hand at your heart, then that's, that's what, that's what that, that point is so important in the growth of one's soul and the growth of one's spiritual, spirit body. That's, that's the key point because the first one is automatic from air coming in, but this one, this one is so. This law point is so important because it's it's the it's the continuation of the physical body to its completion as a real human physical being. It's also 
it's the it's the space between do re mi it's fa it's the space between mi and fa of the spirit octave so that's where the impartiality and the emotion comes in that's where the spirit passes passes through that and it's also the beginning of the soul that's the do start of the soul the soul begins at that point and that and that is um what's talked about in form and sequence is the point that you build you build an, an individuality within yourself that you can measure the world with and and um and you can put the things about the world that you that you learn into this place of your individuality and that's the beginning of your soul and that's that's part of what the work really is at that point i i just um i can't have emphasize that enough i really feel strongly about that that that's an important part and you see a lot of a lot of the other a lot of the other people and i think bennett is is certainly one of them they talk about the the place between c si and do a t and do that is the point that you work with but it's not because if you look carefully at the svensky diagram going back to that chapter where it's in all in in search of the miraculous it talks about he, he maps out the two discontinuities in the in the octave are um, at the, the the last one is between C and Do, where the um, where the vibration speeds up, and it's between Me and Fa that it speeds up, and you could make he makes the lexis for those, but he makes that statement. He says those who understand the work know that the place where you do it is on the triangle. It's the, the place between um, sorry, me, pa, so, soul and la <laughs> is the place that you do the work. That helps the passage from C to Do. You don't work up at C to Do. And that's, and that's such an important thing to understand, that, that that's the place where the work begins on that particular point. And if I... Um, I don't know that that's just to me it's such a re revelation that I've understood you know you could talk about all these different words and how people say okay well I'm, I'm going to walk down the street and I'm going to be aware of all my feet moving every step I'm going to try to be aware of and I'm going to understand and I'm going to and what's going to happen is you're going to daze off and talk see the birds or you're going to listen to something else and and then they say, okay, well, you're not doing the work because you're not, you're not keeping track of all those. If you could keep, keep track of every step you make, then you would really be in the work and you would be really spiritual. And I say, that's not what it is. That isn't what it is. It's it because there's an emotional component of it. And there's a, also a mental component of the form and sequence, what you do with the input that you bring inside the brain, how you build that into what you are, because um, that's your soul. And that's that's not this concept of, of being aware of yourself. You can't possibly be aware of yourself. You can't try to be aware of yourself. Awareness of yourself comes from your inner state you um especially in terms of the spirit that there, there's a warmth inside you that makes you aware you, you're not you can't work on it you you can't try to make yourself aware you become aware because you've built the spirit because you have a spirit you are aware and because you begin a soul you are aware so it's working it backwards i think it i think very much it was an experiment of Kajif to try to build it from the outside in, but ultimately I think you're left from the inside out. So that his methods, I mean, he really did give up his methods in the end. He, they always go back to, okay, well, let's start this school and let's, <laughs> let's have everybody do this work around the farm 
and be aware of all the things they're doing when they're gardening, or let's be really let let them build a um, a shed and then let's destroy the shed because that will teach them a lesson. All of those concepts. He gave those up. Okay, I think it was an experiment because he didn't write Beelzebub's tales that way because you can feel his emotion inside of Beelzebub's tales. There's a there's an emotion there. There isn't that emotion with Uspensky, see? Uspensky is very unemotional, and you can see that. Whereas all and every, Beelzebub's Tales has that emotion that comes through, and that's, I feel, where the work is in, that, in Beelzebub's Tales. So to me, it's like, you can't understand the work unless you can read Beelzebub's Tales and know it from top to bottom. No, so that's what I would say. <laughs> it's a note of your head, your, like you say, your emotions, and to feel it, don't you? Yeah. Read it. Right. Feel, feel it and also to, to um, because the feeling is, one has to be clear that the feeling is from the astral body, the Kastjanian body, is, is um, that's emotions. But then the soul is from a mental thing. The soul is from the mind, and that's hard to, it's harder to understand. I, I've, I've, I've been struggling with that myself. It's like, okay, you can understand that a spirit exists after you die because it's built from air. Air came in, in and it moved forward, and you could see that you built a spirit, and people understand that spirit exists because there's there's an aura to you that you can see and there are ghosts you know like i think it's easier for people to believe that they can build a spirit in a lifetime and be have something that lasts i've i've been thinking about the fact that maybe after you die that you can survive for as long as people remember you your spirit can exist for as long as people remember you. And that's why I think in the old days, the Halloween and stuff, they used to to communicate with the spirits of, of their ancestors because the remembrance of them, and that's done in Mexico too with the Day of the Dead, that, that met remembering the spirits is what keeps them still alive. Um, the ancient Egyptians used to say that as long as your name was never forgotten. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I, I'm thinking that that's true. But then, as Gajeev said, the spirit doesn't last forever. It definitely does have a, a death. And it's still important. It's more important to build a soul because the soul is eternal. But then you start analyzing, well, what? See, you can vaguely know what is what the material of the spirit is. You know, it's not like a chemistry book. <laughs> you know, there's some chemical out there that that transcends the material chemicals that makes a spirit. But what is what is that chemical in terms of a soul? That's that's a very hard one. <laughs> and I've been recently getting into this. There's this mathematician called. Miles Mathis, and he is just amazing. He's pulled apart the equations of Einstein, showed that he made a mistake. It's a minor mistake, but it, it makes a mistake when you've got um, a satellite that's going way past Jupiter and Saturn, and suddenly it falls apart. And he he fixed the equation so it doesn't. And He's done that with so many other things, but his other conjecture is the fact that the basic elementary particle is a is a photon, and physics believes the photon has no mass. They say it's a point particle, and this mathematician says there's no such thing as a point, because a point you have to make a point with a pencil, and you can actually measure that pencil point. There is no such thing as a point, so. Physics is completely wrong with what a what a photon is. A photon is an actual particle that travels at the speed of light, and and photons are used as messenger particles between electrons and 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 
protons in the nucleus. And these messenger particles and the Earth itself contains these, these photons. It's, it brings in photons from, from the north and spills them out at the equator. And all of these photons could explain what um, evolution is all about, that it's not survival of the species, it's the fact that these photons are being shared on an atomic level. And so then I think, well, maybe a soul is built of photons because that, <laughs> something like a photon, but that's where I'm stuck right now in my thoughts. Yeah, to I about that. that. Because of the beauty of that is like God said, let there be light. Well, what is a photon? It's light. So they've been telling us that all along. Yeah. <laughs> let there be light. And then they talk about, of course, the etheric, they've called it the etheric body, but it's hard to have an etheric body because ether doesn't exist anymore, which was proved by that experiment done with Einstein's equation that ether doesn't exist. There's no, you can hear a sound because it travels through air, but they thought you could see light because it traveled through ether. But they've definitely proved that ether doesn't exist. So it's hard to have an etheric body that's made of nothing. <laughs> Okay, right? I did, did not know they so, had that, that experiment. I did not know that they proved ether not to exist. I, I use oh, ether for yes. studies. Okay. They'll laugh at you if you think ether exists. Yeah. You have to go and rethink that. Hold on. <laughs> but but then there's all this dark matter that they can't explain, which is most of the universe, and it's uh, it's made of photons. That's what he okay. says. What do you think of the electric universe theory? Because that explains the, the electric the, universe theory. Oh, I don't know that. Oh, okay. I don't know it well enough to say about it now. Now I've brought it up and it's like, oh, <laughs> but, um, because I think electric universe theory does explain that it, everything's plasma. And everything's plasma. 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 Yeah, it changes um, a lot of the ideas of how the universe is made. That if we have plasma instead of all this dark matter and things like that, plasma would help make electric electromagnetics or electricity and magnetism run through the universe yeah that's that's basically his theory um electromagnetism is is what makes everything tick mm. sure mm. yeah but the behind those things are the are the photon if you go down deeper you get into the photons which are the basis of everything so i'm just I'm just at this point thinking that the soul is made of photons. Like you can build, oh, sorry. build soul. You build your soul with photons by using. Well, you'd think that there are there are cells in the brain, and there are certainly thousands and thousands of photons in those cells in the brain. So maybe that's what builds a soul. At least I'm hoping because I want it. I you know I'm what I'm going to be seventy four. I think in uh, this January 24th. So um, that be a correct statement? 2047 or is it 73? I don't know. It's just Something. a number. <laughs> 73. I always have to ask my wife how old am I? <laughs> I? I wanted to say it's very interesting you brought up the soul because I debate this with a lot of people and I've even because I think Beelzebub's Tales is a guidebook of how to develop your soul. And he's, um, I've, I've often met, I've met many people that have no soul <laughs> throughout my mm -hmm. life. Which is probably why I was drawn towards the Gurdjieff work. Um, but I have a lot of people telling me it isn't, but I suppose the Tales could be, it's how you interpret it. But I think he's telling us how to develop that Keshe Jam body, how to develop our soul and to get off this wheel of life. <laughs> the next stage of whatever that is. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there. Yeah, there's certainly that hope that there is a soul, I think. I, I, I guess I always go back to that fact. We were talking about how so many people are, you could say brainless people that even if they have a degree from the biggest in, in university or whatever, they're still brainless. They're not using their brains. And, and so if you measure oneself against those people, you say, well, 
there's something inside me which is better than them you know it's like it seems wrong to say that but there's definitely something that's better than let's say an ordinary person and therefore there must be something that we were meant to build in this lifetime and that's what's wonderful about Kuchif that he says you're not born with a soul <laughs> so you got to work for it <laughs> and that's that's the most important because other people can use that as such a cop out that they <clears throat> they were born with souls so they don't need to get one their soul is going to last forever or be recon reincarnated and everything will be fine right it's like no can't be that <laughs> And also the fact that sorrow is so important too. The, the, if life was easy, life is difficult for a purpose, isn't it? It's to make you um, build something beyond what exists now in this, in this lifetime. There, otherwise, you know, why not just have life be so easy? <laughs> You can play video games your whole life, never get off the couch. Oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> well, it'd be some some people's idea of heaven, yeah. right? To play a video game the rest of their lives or whatever. It's like life could be that easy, but it never is easy and and there must be a, a reason for that. And that starts that, searching, doesn't it? That makes you start to search for yeah. truth, understanding. Yeah, right. So, totally indebted to Gajeev for that because he he believed it himself, and um, I don't know. I, I went and visited his grave, hoping that maybe I could <laughs> he could say hello to me. I've been there too, <laughs> but no such thing, right? His soul must be on the holy planet Purgatory, as I he said. Watch is over us. The people that are interested in his work. He looks for the acorns that are going to grow into oak trees. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that would be true. That's sort of making him into God, isn't it? Everybody yeah, would believe. But if he's created, not not into a God, but if he has created his case jam body and he, ha he is on the next stage, then hopefully he can look out for us. Or even, maybe not necessarily, you know, just watch over us. I must admit, I myself have often asked him for help in studying the Gurdjieff work and something happens. I don't know what, it's so subtle, but you know, maybe just send that, me that little bit of understanding. And a funny story once actually, I was make, because I make my little films on Beelzebub's towels, and I always ask Mr. Gurdjieff before I make them, is this okay? But one time I finished editing it and I kept feeling something on the back of my head Mm -hmm. Then I looked at the screen and I spelt Beelzebub wrong. And I was thinking about that to Mr. Gurdjieff telling me, come on, look what you've done wrong. <laughs> yeah, maybe, that... maybe it was Beelzebub himself. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I did, yeah, what you're saying is, is what I also believe, that a lot of the people who have contributed so much to this world, you know, people like even Newton and Darwin and all those people that <clears throat> their certainly their knowledge is out there to reach and you can can reach now you could you can that you could when you're brought up as a as a christian or whatever you can believe that you feel that you're with jesus that he's just because it's that other state that you're in that kind of I kind of think of that as I kind of think of that as basically vibrations that have been left behind around the world that they're there. They're not necessarily the people themselves, but just their contribution is there to touch and connect with because it's that other state. Uh, so I, I know what you mean. It's like, yeah, <laughs> but I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if. Um, Kajif would be very kindly with me and correct me, right? Because here I am tearing him down well, <laughs> a lot of the time. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> but if people wanted to follow more on your work, it's um, justwizard.com, your website. Your oh, 
No, well, Gurdjieff, duh. Justwizard.com. Justwizard yes, right. But you can find it because I said I was so amazed that when I typed in Gurdjieff and the word soul in Google, up came your site on the left and my site on the right. So <laughs> it's like we were meant to have this talk. <laughs> Well, I have more talks, if that's okay, if you're up for it in the future. Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. And thank you ever so much, Dylan. I will, I'll yeah, press yeah. in a moment. Uh, you've also just got one other website. Did you want to mention that? Uh, Pesha of Christ? Pesha of Christ. Well, that would get into a longer discussion. But I, I, I've spent a lot of time on that one, proving that... Um, proving that all of the um, miracles in the New Testament are just allegorical stories that didn't happen. And um, I guess I could leave it. That's why, that's why it's the pressure of Christ, to understand that, that Jesus was a regular person, not a God. He never said he was a God anyway. It's other people that have said he was a God. He only said he was the Son of Man. He was never the, never said he was the son of God, but that I, I guess it's, it was my hang up as a Christian scientist. I was supposed to be able to heal myself um, with the correct spiritual thoughts. And I realized that's not. And the way you, you, you thought that is because Jesus did all these healings, but I proved that he didn't. And. It wasn't me that started with it. It was this lady, um, Barbara Thiering from Australia, who, who wrote a whole book on Jesus the Man. And I helped to build the site, and I also built my own site with my own thoughts on it. So that's out there, too. I'm more kind of all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> if you start looking for me. <laughs> I'd like to do a show on that sometime as well in the future, because I study divinity, so I, I like theology. So I think that'd be a great show to do. Oh, yeah, it does sound like a good one, yeah. Hey, because I can also prove to you that uh, Judas was um, betrayed Jesus. He wasn't the good guy that Gurdjieff said he was. Yes. <laughs> That'd be a good show as well. We've got lots of shows to do in the future, so people wait to be... watch out for the future. We'll be coming back, me and Dylan Stevens. There we go. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to thank you now. I'll press stop and yes. we'll afterwards. But thank you very much for speaking, Dylan Stevens. Yes, it was fun. Yeah, nice casual discussion. I enjoyed it. Oh, okay. thank you. Bye.